is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. If you would please stand with me and take your hymn book to hymn number 133. We'll sing through all three verses of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hymn number 133. to see everybody this morning. Uh, you might be wondering where Pastor Payne is this morning. Earlier this week, he had been uh, been working out, getting that restarted, and I uh, had a little, it, what in the beginning was a twinge in his back, and as all guys do, they press through it and assume it's going to go away, and uh, it did not go away, and it's uh, gotten worse and worse to a place this morning he thought he had a kidney stone. He called his, obviously we know James, his son, is a urologist, so he called and talked to him, 
and James pretty much ruled out that it was probably not a kidney stone, but is a bulging or herniated disc most likely. So in a lot of pain this morning, more so than he usually deals with. So they went to the emergency room this morning and they are there. Uh, Brother Hugh and Miss Regina is over there with uh, Miss Tracy. So as of right now, that's just where it stands. And what we're going to do, now let me just say this to you as a church family. We all love him and want to reach out. But when Pastor Payne is not a good patient. <laughs> He's just not. And if we all text him, he's going to want to think he has to respond in detail to everybody, uh, even during whatever they're doing to him there. So we don't want to make those folks' job any more difficult than, than, than what it is there. So what I'm going to do is when I hear something, I'm going to utilize our, our Breeze texting. And if we hear something between now and the evening service, um, I will let the church body know that. But... I'm assuming he's just going to be in there for the, for the day and for however long he needs to be. And so, um, you know, we all want to reach out, but if we could hold off just a little bit on that, I conveyed to him when I talked to him this morning that that's what I was going to, to announce there. And so we're going to pray for him here in just a moment. But if we kind of hold off on those things a little bit, family's taken care of, and uh, we just got to wait and see. But, and let's just pray that it's nothing major and that he will uh, be back and rolling as, as soon as possible. So let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father, we are, we are thankful, Lord, and we are a, we're a concerned body this morning. Lord, as much as we love, love our pastor and are thankful for him, Lord, he is human. And Lord, and what he's going through right now, Father, Lord, you know, and you knew all about it. Lord, we do lift him up right now. I know he's in a lot of pain. Lord, we ask you, Lord, that they would give him whatever he needs. And, Lord, that you would intercede, Lord, on behalf of the, the pain that he's going through. And, Lord, the, the diagnosis, Father, we ask you, Lord, that it would be complete and accurate. And that, Lord, the, the steps need to be taken would be taken there. Father, we lift up Miss Tracy to you this morning and, and pastor's family and children and grandchildren. Lord, as they're concerned as we are. And, Lord, help us, we pray, Lord, to, to pray and to give the support that is needed and necessary there. And, Lord, we just ask you to be with our preacher this morning. And, Lord, that you would raise him up. Lord, Brother Pat's going to preach for us this morning, stepping in at the last minute, our good and faithful evangelist. So, Lord, we're thankful for that. And, Father, we're thankful, Lord, that we do have a church body, Lord, that can be unified in the thought of all loving our preacher and being concerned about him this morning. So, Lord, we do lift him up, but, Lord, we are here this morning to bring honor and glory to you. So, Lord, as the choir sings, as we give, as we hear from the word of God, Lord, may you get the honor and glory this morning. Lord, we do love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may.
Don't you just love this time of year? If you would please stand with me and take your hymn book to hymn number 138. We'll sing through the first verse of Go Tell It on the Mountain. Take a moment to greet one another. Hymn number 138. singing, please be seated. All right. You know, those, those songs only have one verse. I don't know if they're the best for handshaking time around here. Hard to get everybody back in. So, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if you are visiting with us this morning, I know we got a few visitors. If you did not receive a visitor packet uh, when you came in at the visitor's desk, we'd like you to serve you. We'd like to serve you with one of these. It's got a little card to fill out, some information about the church. So if you're visiting, our ushers have these in hand, and they'll come right where you are and serve you with one. So if you're visiting, just slip your hand up right quick, and we'll get you one of these. Looking around real quick. All right, need one right there. Jerry's got those folks. All right, anybody else? All right, very good, very good. All right, well, several announcements this morning. Uh, first off, let me just say uh, I got a really good report from our third through fifth, fifth grade junior church over at doing their singing at Dow Gardens there. Anybody get to see that? I know a few of you were able to go over and see that there, so I got a good report on what went on. I did not go. It was my night to go see Tobias. 
So uh, life stopped, all right? So I went over and saw him, but heard they did a great job. Appreciate uh, Miss Danny and Brother Ben and all the work that they put into that there. And along those lines, we have our Christmas, uh, children's Christmas program tonight at 6 o'clock. And I've been given this announcement. The two through five-year-olds need to be in Miss Cindy's class right down here at the end, straight down the hallway in her classroom there at 5.30. Two to five-year-olds, 5.30. First through 12th grade need to be in their seats in the sanctuary by 5.45. So they're back there getting their instruction and going over it this morning. So they will know where they're supposed to be seated. If not, if they come in, uh, there will be somebody to guide and direct them, Brother Jason Warner or uh, Miss Stephanie there. All right. Anything to add to that? It'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you come in, you're not sure, uh, check with Miss Stephanie and she can get them right where they need to be there. So having them here on time is so helpful to all those that are directing it there. And we'll look forward to that. We do have our cookie fellowship afterwards tonight, so bring some good bacon. Preacher said go buy cookies. That's incorrect. Go make cookies, okay? Go make something there. And uh, Brother Bob, I'm talking to you because uh, you're gifted. I've tasted your cookies before there. And uh, so make something for tonight, and we'll enjoy a good time of fellowship after celebrating uh, with our children. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night, we'll have our Bible studies uh, here at the church. And then next Sunday night, we'll be doing the Eve of Music, and that'll be at 6 o'clock as well. Right after the service this morning, we've had a great response as far as getting our pictures taken for the photo directory. So what we're doing is we don't have scheduled times anymore. If you've not got your picture taken, uh, and you can stay after the service for maybe 10, 15 minutes. We'll be able to get you in. Just come right over here. Uh, we'll have a table. We'll get set up quickly, get you in and out, and we'll do that for this week and next week and see if we can wrap, wrap this thing up here and have everybody's going to participate in that there. If you have a question and you see me, I'll be right down here after the service. And just, just for the sake of it, please take note on December the 24th, there will be a Christmas Eve service, that's on a Sunday, but there will be no 10 a.m. Sunday school. So on December the 24th, not next Sunday, but the next, we will not have uh, Sunday school, but we will have um, regular service and our Christmas Eve service that evening there. December the 27th, there will be no evening service there. All right, I think that is all of our announcements for today. So men, if you'll come, We'll take up our morning offering, and also let me make note of this. Preacher um, announced it on uh, Wednesday night. Sister Barbara Westfield, she hadn't been going here very, very long, but uh, he did announce that she had passed away this past week, and so we're going to be having her funeral here at the church. I don't have the information in front of me, so I'm going to look at Miss Janet. On Thursday, the visitation will be from 10 till 12, a little bit different, a little bit longer. So the visitation will be from 10 till 12, and then the service will be from 12 until 1, and then we will eat at 1. So if you can have the food here, there's a sign-up sheet in the um, back there for, that Miss Janet put up. So if you can sign up for that and be a part of that, uh, I know maybe, maybe a lot of you didn't know, we don't know exactly how many is going to be in the funeral uh, but if you can sign up and help us out, we would greatly appreciate that. So 10 to 12 visitation, 12 to 1 will be the service, and so food needs to be here during that time, and they should eat right around 1 o'clock there. All right, Brother Chris Gray, would you pray for us, sir? Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you so much. When God came and lived among us, we could see his glory shine. 
a glory like no one before him, nor will be through endless time. Far beyond the power of angels, holy God and holy man, so full of grace and truth and mercy with a shepherd's gentle hand. Moses gave the law to bind us. The prophets spoke just as they had heard. But Jesus came and lived among us and we touched the living word seeing jesus we saw the father the great physician the sinner's friend loving all who would receive him and he loved us to the end virgin born the son of david by jealous hatred was crucified oh but the grave just could not hold him and he arose no more to die rising son of Life unbounded, the light of all who ever see. And from his overflowing bounty, grace for grace he gave to you and me. When Jesus, when Jesus came and lived among us, we could see his glory shine when he ascended to the father he made that glory yours and mine the promised power his holy spirit has come to make our hearts his home to shine the righteous light of Jesus till he comes back to claim his own. Till he comes back to claim his own. Gray Page can sing, can he? All oh, yuccapella too. Way to go. Turn your Bibles to the book of Mark. It's always nice to be able to come a Sunday morning when Pastor Payne isn't here and disappoint a bunch of people. <laughs> Especially Fred Herner. Hello, Fred Herner in Florida. You know those guys. Brian and Ray, I want you to do something, not right now, but when we get out this morning, the new Christmas tracks that are in the track rack, I'd like you to take handfuls and stand by the door. Mark ordered these, and they're very good. And they're so good, they don't need to stay in the rack. We got just a little bit of time so Brian and Ray will be at the front door, and these Christmas tracks, they're, they're laid out a little different, and they do all the work for you, and it's, a, it's just a nice platform. I've enjoyed using them a little bit, so see to that. Mark in chapter 9 is where we'll be. You can continue to pray for Bonnie. She's not here. Uh, she is on the mend. We are finally on the mend after six weeks of coughing and all that stuff that everybody else has got. Hers, hers changed each time. We went to the ready med a couple times, and now we've been to the real doctor, and 
and uh, we might be, you might see her, but I don't know if you'll see her tonight. We've yet to go see Tobias. We're not allowed to go over there and cough and sneeze and hack on the new baby. Uh, you know how that works. But uh, eventually, we're Gigi's, great grandpas, you know, and uh, we'll get over there eventually. Mark in chapter 9 is where you'll be in just a minute. My son-in-law, Brian Baggett, sent me this text this morning. He said, these are the three rules of engagement at church. And he's got a little smiley face because he was pointing it at me. He said, a, a person that comes to church by themselves is an emergency for us. Friends can wait. Introduce a newcomer to someone else. These are the three rules of engagement. A person that comes by themselves is an emergency. Greet them. Friends can wait. Introduce a newcomer to someone else. We ought to be missionaries at church. That's, that's from Brian to me, but I shared that with you. So there you are. Mark in chapter 9. The familiar verse in Mark in chapter 9, preacher spent quite a time for several weeks expounding and talking to us about hell. I mean, if you missed it, you ought to go back and look at it. It'll wear you out listening to about hell and make you so thankful that you don't have to go there. Well, Mark in chapter 9, if draw your attention down to verse 42. It says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones and that believe in me, and is, it is better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck then he were cast into the sea. But if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better that thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Look up here. 99 out of 100 churches will never read that verse to you. You can go up and down this street. You can cover this state. You go nationwide as I get a chance to. And they do not talk about hell. They do not talk about hell. Well, I want to talk just a little bit about hell. But if I was to title this, which Ethan, my grandson up there, messing with the video, he said, what's the title? And I said, oh, a title. Okay, here's the title. Things that are not a mystery. <laughs> yeah, kind of a catchy little slant there. Things that are not a mystery. Let's make a prayer. Now deliver this thought that God gave me this morning. The Father, it's me again. I stand here behind a sacred desk with a wonderful opportunity to encourage the saints. But Lord, I will fail miserably unless you empower me. I'm not here to entertain. I'm here to uplift the name of Christ. I want to encourage the saints that at this time of year, it's not all about hustle and bustle and giving gifts, but it's about our Savior. So, Lord, this morning I pray that you do hide me behind the cross. Fill me with your spirit. Give me that fluidity of heart and mind and soul that I can preach with unction. Lord, if there's someone here that's never come to Christ, if hellfire is still their destiny, I pray that they would settle that today. And then, Lord, there's all the rest of us 
that have maybe come to Christ but yet are disappointed and rejected in some way in some problem, situation, some health need. Lord, I pray that you would meet all of our needs in this sanctuary in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Things that are not a mystery. The first thing that's not a mystery is lost people go to hell. That is not a mystery. Turn, if you would, over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Well, it's that's New Testament, okay? Just trying to help my friend. Ephesians chapter 5. We could go down to my life's verse. Oh, yeah, why don't we? Ephesians 5, chapter uh, 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto the Lord. That, that, that's, that's my life's verse right there. Huh? Sure, sure. That's, that was a joke, okay? That was a joke. But if we were to start there, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. One of the things that's not a mystery is lost people go to hell. It's not a mystery. It's also not a mystery that Jesus Christ started the church. He's the founder of the church. Oh, we know that in Acts 9, the apostle Paul was was there, you know, that's how we, the body of Christ, you know all that. It's not my job to teach you that today. But it's not, it's not a mystery that lost people go to hell. Just the other day, I had opportunity for a man that came to my house and we visited. And if I threw his name out there, somebody just said, know it, and I'm not going to do that because I told him I wouldn't. But as I spoke with him and visited after some time, I, I spent a lengthy time telling him exactly how I got saved. It hung over in an 84 Chevette. Can you get shaved, saved in a Chevette? Yeah, I did. How do you know you're saved, Brother Bolton? I was there when it happened. That was 39 years ago. Hey, 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 look at that. Grandma and Grandpa, Grandma and Grandpa. Yeah, sure they are. No excuse to be late. <laughs> they always told me if you got here after the offering, you were late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, showing pictures. Okay, but I'm doing the preaching right now. I want to talk to you about things that are not a mystery, and the first thing is that lost people die and go to hell. This man that was with me the other day after some time talking, and, and I said, well, what, here's exactly what happened. I said, my brother-in-law, Tom Bowman, who's in heaven today, began to tell me that without Christ, I had no hope. I was utterly hopeless without Christ. I'd really never heard that. He frightened me with what he told me. I didn't let him know that at the time. But I'm here to tell you, it is not a mystery that lost people go to hell. And just the other day, this man I was with, he said to me, he said, Pat, I just need help. Let me assure you, this man did not own a Bible. He'd never been to church other than a couple times to a funeral and a wedding. You say, oh, how unusual. No, that's not unusual. You got to get out more often, folks. You knock on a few doors up and down these streets, 90% of these people don't go to church at all. 90%. Don't you think that they know about hell because they don't know about hell. I took this man back in my living room and I said, have you ever, ever read the Bible? He said, no, I've never opened it. And I said, what do you think this book is? He said, it says job. He didn't know. He didn't know how to run it. I showed him where the table of contents was. I showed him the Old Testament and the New Testament. I began to tell him immediately about the Apostle Paul. 
Why not start him out right? Because you see, just moments before that, after he understood that Christ was the Savior of the world and that lost people go to hell, he determined he did not want to go to hell. And he asked Christ to save him. You'll meet him later on. He's making his way. He texted me the next day. After I showed him how to run the Bible and, and where this was and where that was, I said, in fact, I'll tell you right now. I bought you a beautiful buckskin Bible, but you're not getting it. <laughs> this man has this new Bible. We wrote his name in it. We scratched different things. I said, don't be afraid to write in this Bible. I want to tell you this, in that hour, in that hour, he knew that lost people go to hell and he wasn't going there. He texted me three days ago and said, do you know there's more than one John in that Bible? (laughs) Evidence of his salvation as far as I'm concerned. The first thing that is not a mystery is that lost people go to hell. The second thing that's not a mystery is, like it says here in, in verse 23, even as Christ is the head of the church. We know that Christ is the head of the church. He is the head of the church. We don't come here to worship Pastor Payne. There's many, many people in here love Pastor Payne, but he loved you first. I mean, that's how that went. So, so not only is it not a mystery that lost people go to hell, it's not a mystery that Jesus Christ started the church. He's the founder of the church. This entire book of, of Christ and his prophets and his apostles and even the evangelists, Christ started the church. When you come here and you write your checks like you do, you write your checks, you drop them in, you're not giving it to Midland Baptist Church. You're giving it to the Lord. And once you drop it in there, it's, it's his. Well, it was actually his before you dropped it in, but... Not only is the founder of the church not a mystery, the function of the church is not a mystery. Turn uh, here in Ephesians, look at verse 24. Verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved Christ the church. One of the functions of the church is to love people and and love them right where they're at. I got a call this morning at five after seven. I'd been out of the shower a bit and I was thinking about which car to bring. (laughs) Good option. And a man called me and began to whine because oil was running out of his car. Dan Greenwood's closed on Sunday, so he didn't know what to do. So what did I do? Well, I grabbed 10 quarts of oil out of my garage and met him because he was leaking oil. Well, what do you do when you got a leak in oil? Well, you go get it fixed. You keep enough oil in it while you're driving. You'll be okay. He put what oil he had, I drove six miles, met him, gave him 10 quarts of oil, and I said, just keep pouring it into you, get to where you got to go. And he went over to Walmart. Why? Because he changed oil at Walmart five days ago and hadn't driven the car much. The problem was the oil filter was screwed on crooked, and it was their problem, and they're fixing it, and they're giving him a half a dozen free oil changes, and the motor did not blow up. Now, this man is not saved. But you see, lost people go to hell. And one of the functions of the church is to love people. That doesn't mean rightly divide your Bible, rightly divide your Bible, and just sit in the house and tell nobody about Christ. You better divide your Bible. You won't even know how to lead people to Christ. But... Loving people right where they're at. Do you think I really wanted to drive 
six miles in the wrong direction and give this guy $25 worth of oil? No. But he's already texted me twice about him buying me lunch today. <laughs> me and Free, we get along well. But the function of the church, these, why, why did I bring up these tracks? Folks, if you don't ever get them out of the rack, nobody's going to read them. Christmas is, you say, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas, that's what it says, Merry Christmas. That we ought to run out of these tracks. The function of the church is to love people right where they're at. That's how we exalt the Savior. We exalt the Savior by telling people about it. My grandson, Patrick Baggett, they gave me a head start, named him after me. But he, he was here several years ago, and here's what he said. He said, my wife, Ashley, is not in the room right now. She's taking care of the babies. He was about to sing, and he was going to preach. And he said this. He said, you don't know Ashley. You've never seen Ashley. Most of you have never seen Ashley. But if I was to tell you what Ashley means to me and how she cares for me and what she does for me, when I was done telling you all about Ashley and how much I love her and what she means to me, every one of you would want to meet her. And that's the way you ought to tell people about Jesus Christ. Don't just leave a track in a bathroom, hide in the corner. Don't look at me that way. People die. Lost people go to hell. The founder of the church is Christ. But the function of the church, what is the function of the church? Number one function, keep people out of hell. That's what we're doing here. We're going to have a program tonight. We're going to eat good cookies. I know that. Is it to show you all the, the four-year-olds that are going to act goofy and wear those little things on their head? I love coming. I've been watching my grandkids grow up in this church. I got three or four of them in the choir. Praise the Lord. And when they were little, we loved all that. I mean, Miss Cindy's a hero. She, she brings them up in here in such a blast. The entertainment is not the importance of what goes on. Why do we have a cookie fellowship? Not to feed them cookies. It's so that after they've seen their little ones, their relatives, they come over there and they're looking for somebody who's just like you and wants to talk to them and become their friend and introduce themselves and visit with them. When we go over there tonight, don't get 12 Christians and sit by your little table all by yourself and have a little click going over here. And you got these visitors over here with nobody. The function of the church is to love people, to love them. John McCormick back here. Wave your hand, John. Higher. He works at Everett Carpet. When you want carpet, go see John. That's a commercial. Why? Because he's a brother beloved. I can assure you that when some, uh, one of his customers uh, produces a large sale, he sends them a thank you note, a text, or an email, something, and follows through on that. When we get people to come to our church program like it's going to happen tonight, following through and part of the love is to go over and eat a cookie and talk to somebody you don't know. My wife, when she talks to a stranger, she breaks out in hives. She gets red clear up to her chin. But she does it anyway. Bonnie will lead more people to Christ by her non-conversation. She's a great listener. I, I have people tell me that all the time. I'm not such a great listener. <laughs> but the function of the church is to love people. The founder of the church, yes, is Jesus Christ.
T turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 14. 4, 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Look up here. It says, no more of children. Some of you have been saved a lot of years, and you know a lot of Bible. But who gets that from you? Are, are, are you loving people? I'm not scolding you. I'm trying to encourage you. You see, part of growing up, when, when you get saved, here's exactly what happens. You know, you're, you're lost as a goose. You, you die, you know you're going to hell and all that. But you finally come to Christ. You get saved. And here you are. You're down here, and you're just a little baby. Oh, I'm saved. Oh, I'm saved. I'm going to go Sunday morning, and someday I'll go to Sunday school, and maybe even Wednesday. But I'm just so saved. I'm so saved. I'm so saved. 30 years later, you're crawling around on your knees saying, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. Well, it said be no more of children. Yeah, I can still get up. <laughs> no more children. You can... You're only young once, but you can be immature forever. And, and part of maturity in Christ is loving people right where they're at, telling them about Christ. Those that are in this room that have survived cancer, and we got handfuls of them, handfuls. If there was a, a medicine that they could carry around with them and hand out and say, here, take this. This will cure cancer. Cure cancer. Cure cancer. Cure cancer. Everybody would want to do that. We have it better than that. <laughs> we have it better than that. We've got a cure for eternal life. You're going to live somewhere, heaven or hell. But you're only young once, but you can be immature forever. And as you grow, you know, you, I can remember what it was like. Wait, I got a gospel track and I, I memorized all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Then, then I memorized that there's, there's death and then there's hell and there's heaven. And I kept memorizing just enough, just enough to where I could tell people about Christ, that I could get to a gospel track. You've been saved 20 years and you yet. When's the last time? Can you tell me the last time that you had a soul winning confrontation? Well, I, 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 I I'm not scolding you. I'm telling you, we got Christmas coming. You're going to be around that tree. You're going to be seeing relatives you haven't seen in forever. And, and they're going to say, well, what's new? And here's most people. Oh, nah. What's new? What's new is we had somebody saved. What's new is our preacher's teaching on this. The Word of God says this. I just found this in the Bible. Did you know this about the Bible? Oh, I don't know how well that would be received. Who cares? You cannot witness wrong to a person on his way to hell. If my brother-in-law would have never stepped up, and when he got saved, I came to the door with a box of Miller's beer. And uh, he said, oh, hi, Pat, come on in, but that can't come in. Huh? What's going on? He said, well, I got saved. And I said, you got what? He said, that can't come in. I said, well, if that can't come in, I ain't coming in. Ruth was there. I turned Bonnie around. I said, we're out of here. Well, that's my brother-in-law. <laughs> I got 13 brother-in-laws, but hey, he was just my best friend. That only lasted three weeks, and I was back in the door with no beer. Yeah, he said to me, can I take the Bible and show you something? I said, no. I don't look in that book. Bonnie tried that years ago. I ain't going to look in there. I'm talking to you about the function of the church. Tom looked at me. He took me in the living room. He got right down on one knee, looked me right square in the face, man to man, and he said this, and nobody had ever said this other than Bonnie. He said, I love you. No man had ever said that. He said, I, I love you. Can I just show you one time, and I'll never show you again? I said, okay. 
<laughs> he showed me. And when he was done, I don't know what he said. When he was done, I was happy he was done. I mean, out of here quick. But eight years later, eight years later, I watched him go to church and being kind and helping me and helping my kids and doing all he could do. See, the function of the church is to love people right where, don't try and change people. Just love them right where they're at. The function of the church. But it's time you grow up. And part of growing up, part of maturity is telling other people that you're saved. Just, just simply, hey, by the way, uh, it's Christmas time and it's special for, for me because I'm, I'm saved. And then shut up and listen to what they say. It, I've got a new thing I've been doing for the last year. I, I say this, what does the word gospel mean to you? And then just shut up. People say, well, a church word, I guess. They don't know. So I say, well, could, can I tell you? Can I tell you? Either they say yes or they say no. Most of the time they say, yeah. And I say, well, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know much about that? And either they say yes or they say no, or they stop you right then. That's okay. Eight days from now, I'll be in Florida. <laughs> Tea time already set. <laughs> but I go to Florida, and I have an amazing time down there. It's not the golf, and it's not the sunshine. It goes like this. Today, I weigh 242 pounds. When I come back in May, it'll be less. Why? Because I get on a bicycle. I get on a bicycle and I ride around the streets of Zephyr Hills. Zephyr Hills has 20,000 people in it. And in 30 days, it has 100,000 visitors move in. 234 RV parks. And Fat Pat gets on his bike and he rides around and I look for tags that are not Florida tags on cars. This is how it works. This is the function of the church. Especially if they got a big gold M on them or a green, you know, with the helmet. And it, it's, it's, you know what it's like when you see somebody, you're out of state and you see somebody that's got a Michigan tag. Hey, Michigan, where do you live, you know? <laughs> they all do it. So I say to them, where are you going to church Sunday? Oh, we can't go down here. Well, why? Well, because there's only one Catholic church and one Lutheran church, and there's stuff full of people and nobody can get in. Well, guess what? The Baptist church has all got food. <laughs> and if it's got a King James Bible, I'm preaching there sometime. I'll be there on Christmas Eve at the first church. I'll be at the next church on that Wednesday, following Wednesday. I'll be in a church next Sunday. I'll be doing, I just got two revivals come in last week. Praise God. But the function of the church is to keep people out of hell. That is the function of the church. And it's time, see, you've got to carry the burden. It is a burden when you know somebody like my brother Joe. My brother Joe is not saved. He'll tell you he's not saved. And he'll tell you, I don't need to hear it from you. When I'm ready to get saved, I'll call my brother. That's his defense. But the burden on my heart is my brother Joe is not saved. You know people that aren't saved, lots of them. It ought to be a burden on your heart. I mean, you go to that same place all the time, whether it's the dry cleaners or wherever you go, the same place every time. That person that's not saved ought to be a burden on your heart. We, we must carry that burden as adults in Christ, as mature, you know, it, Things that are not a mystery. Yes, Christ is the founder of the church. Yes, the function of the church. But also, we're the family of the church. We are the forever family. And as the forever family, we've got work to do. And the work is always the same. Lead somebody to Christ. Point them to the Savior. Because without Christ, two, two days ago, Clarksville, Tennessee, 
for the third time in 12 years got hit by tornadoes. Two more people died, Mark. I don't know how many times I've been to Clarksville because that's where Brian Baggett's from. The entire town was leveled. Banks were leveled. Two people died. I don't know if they were saved, but that's the first thing I think of. When, when I see somebody, somebody died, a helicopter crash, a crane, what do you, that's all I think of. Well, you're an evangelist, so what? I put my pants on just like you do, sir. The burden, the burden is people aren't saved, and we need to help them. All we hear from you is, well, I have to work with these unsaved people at work, and I, I'm so... Be thankful God's given you people surrounded you that you don't have to go look for lost people. You work in that little Hobby Lobby environment where granddaughter works. I mean, I bet there's a bunch of them there not saved. <laughs> oh, don't look at me that way. <laughs> we are to carry the burden, but also we're to cause the battle. You see, when you got this burden on you, when you, when you see people that aren't saved, that is the passion of Christ. And it's a passion that cannot be quenched. When you get to, what, what causes a brother like Mark Simpson to preach five times a week? He does. What is the burden? To raise up teenagers so they can tell other teenagers so they can grow into adults so people don't go to hell. It's the same message. He's just reaching a different people group. Now he's passed the baton to Andrew. And Brother Watts got the same burden. He's got a burden. It's a, it's a passion that cannot be quenched. It is an obsession that cannot be denied. It is a vision that cannot be dimmed. I've been saved 39 years, and I never, never, never tire telling somebody about Jesus Christ. It's why I get up in the morning. I don't leave my room until I load myself up. By the way, I'm out of brochures. Uh, with brochures and gospel tracts. I've asked Mark because he helps me getting those things. What are they? Well, they got the pictures of my grandkids and my kids on the back. I, I, I want to I wanna cause the battle. Not just carry the burden, but cause the battle. Because it's a passion. It's a vision that cannot be dimmed. And it's a mission we cannot abandon, folks. Jason Warner preached a message about 20 years ago out of Jude. And it says, some having compassion, making a difference. Jude 22, the first book of Jude. <laughs> Verse 22, some having compassion, making a difference. He said, we ought to be a mad Christian. M-A-D, making a difference. I've dragged that all over the nation. I don't know who he got it from, but I liked it. And we ought to be carrying the burden, but we ought to cause the battle. Folks, we know that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. We know that. We know that Jesus Christ died there. We know that he's not, he's not dead. He's not dead. He's not hanging on a crucifix. It's Christmas time. Jesus Christ is not a baby. He is not a dead man on a cross. Jesus Christ is alive. I was just talking to him a minute ago. What are you going to do this Christmas? Are you going to cower in the corner? It's not a mystery that lost people die and go to hell. It is the heartbeat of God. I love the church. Yes, I love the church because somebody said the music. Yes. I love the church because of the methods. We pray for one another. We, we pray for our, our, our bishop this morning, Brother Payne. We're praying for him. We pray for each other. We, that's a method of the church. But the, the function of the church is to love people right where they're at. Do something. I was watching a documentary on World War II the other day. It's amazing what you find on your phone. <laughs> I'm watching this, and it's showing housewives leaving, going into the factories to build tanks. World War II. 
bring it a little fresher. 20 years ago when 9-11 took place, everybody was saying, pray God, pray God. In World War II, everybody got involved. It was a passion. It was a burden to be patriotic and boost America. Folks, we're, we're a family. We're a family. And there's many, many people outside of the family. And it ought to be a burden, a burden. You carry the burden, but you cause the battle. You have to do something. It's a passion that cannot be quenched. It's an obsession that cannot be denied. It is a vision that cannot be dimmed. It is a mission we cannot abandon. Because of my brother-in-law and many other Christians, I came to Christ. I learned that he was the founder of the church. Oh, yeah, later I learned Apostle Paul in Acts 9 had something to do with all that, the body of Christ. But I didn't know any of that when I got saved. I know that the founder of the church is Christ, and the function of the church is to keep people out of hell. But the future of the church... Turn to 1 Thessalonians and we'll be done. 1 Thessalonians will be done. You see, it's, it's our job. It is the heartbeat of God. It is the heartbeat of God. We all need to have this burden. This, we need to tell people this time of year is a wonderful opportunity. This is a job, folks. It's a wonderful chance. This, this chance, this job... Here's a job about, here's a story about four people, everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job, our job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have did it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job, and everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could do. That's There we are at Christmas. <gasps> Christmas is gone already. Here it is, the 10th. You got 14 days to unload a 1,000 gospel tracts. And this is the army. This is the forever family. These are the people that have the burden. These are the people that need to cause the battle. You're in 1 Thessalonians. I'm not, but I'll get there shortly. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, we talked about the founder of the church, the function of the church. How about the future of the church? Had to have an F in there. First, First Thessalonians chapter 4. You know how many people don't know about this? When it's, it's Christmas time and they say, well, how's it going? Well, just waiting on the rapture. Huh? What? They don't know that. See, I like to say things that are not so churchy, you drive people away, but I do like to instill some curiosity, just waiting on the rapture. What's that? Well, just go ahead and memorize this verse. 4.13, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would you have you to, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, they sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You know the verse. For if we believe that Jesus died. See, here, here's what it is. Here's the whole thing. People believe that Jesus Christ died. They, that's history. They know that. But they don't really know or believe that he died for them. It's personal. You got to have it for them. And that's the burden that you've got to share is how what Christ means to you. It's the function. It's just not to, to tell them you're saved, but to tell them how to be saved. Here, in, and we're reading along, it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring him with him. 
And as we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, here's all you have to memorize. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. They don't know about that. That is a mystery. That is a mystery. They don't know about it. If you stopped 100 people at Myers, 99 of them would tell you, I don't know what the rapture is. If you held a $20 bill out, you think I've ever done this? (laughs) $5 is what I held out. (laughs) Sorry. At the flea market, at the flea market, I would just stand there. Bonnie's over here doing her stuff, looking for fleas. <laughs> and I say, if you can tell me what the rapture means, I'll give you this $5. And I say that and say that. And I have a few Christians come by. Good job, brother. Good job. I'm just looking to be, you won't do this. That's okay. I'm doing it the way I like to do it. Just do something. Make some cookies. Come tonight. Meet a visitor. Things that are not a mystery is the function of the church. The future of the church is simple. We're out of here soon, folks. We're gone. And and folks, (laughs) there are going to be very few people saved after we're gone. It is... It's a passion that cannot be quenched. It is an obsession that cannot be denied. It is a vision that cannot be dimmed. It is a mission that cannot be abandoned. We're going to stand to our feet. I'll ask once again, if you're not saved here this morning, we take a Bible and show you how to be saved. If you are saved and you want to enlist yourself in a season, Christ is the reason for the season. Maybe you ought to come to the altar, an old-fashioned altar. An altar is a place where you alter your life. When I come to an altar, as preacher says, I'm an altar athlete. (laughs) I'm always at the altar. What do I do here? Well, sometimes I'm praying for you. Sometimes I'm praying for me. But sometimes I come, and I want to be like John. I just want want to lay my head on the bosom of the Savior. I just want to get close. I I like it up here. It re-energizes me. It helps me. I get that in the morning as I read the book. I just want to encourage you. The heartbeat of God is for you to point somebody else to Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. You're assuming that position you've assumed many times. This is where some of you have already zipped up your Bible and you're already out the door mentally. But the fact is, the invitation is about to open up. We're going to have an organ play. People stand to their feet. The heartbeat of God is pulsating in some people's minds and they have lost people on their heart and and they're thinking about them and they're thinking they, they, they need to solidify that with a prayer for whoever it is. And they'll probably come and pray. But you're here this morning and you're not saved. You don't know whether Jesus is alive or dead, but you know you don't have him. And hell does frighten you, and it should. That's you this morning. No one looking around, just me. I'll pray for you. Just up with a hand and go, hey, pray for me. I, I don't know whether I'm going to heaven or hell. I, 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 any more? Any other hands? Any other? A father... These are the saints. These are the soldiers of the cross. If these people do not want to reach Midland, who will? These are the people. So, Lord, I pray that these people would be encouraged to cause the battle for the will of God. Everyone standing as she's playing, maybe you'd like to come and just talk to the Lord about one of your relatives. Talk to the Lord about one of your unsaved grandchildren. It's time. It's time. It's time. We've had church. Now it's time to pray. Maybe you want to pray for Brother Payne. Well, pray for Brother Payne. Let's pray.
Let's pray. This is when we pray. We don't just stand there and wonder what lunch is going to be. We pray. This is the method of the church, the function of the church. We pray people in, into the body of Christ. That's what happened to me. I got prayed in. Father Mark's going to come right now as an announcement or two. Look up here if you would. You're not any more spiritual because you come down front. That's, that's a lie. I just like it down front. And I just encourage you, if you've never visited the altar, try it out. Brother Mark. Amen. That's good. That's good. Needful for the time. Uh, Miss Tracy sent me a text and said that they gave him a steroid shot, lidocaine patch, muscle relaxers, try this one, uh, toroidal, T-O-R-O-I-D-A-L, that word, uh, shot, no MRI at this time, hopefully he won't try to go tonight. <laughs> um, I asked if they were heading home and she said soon, probably, so... That is the, uh, the update, so we're going to assume that he will make it home today and um, allow those things to run their course and be able to, uh, to go from there. So that's, that's an update. And one reminder, we will be starting over here momentarily uh, taking the pictures if you have not got your picture taken yet. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, to be to be challenged about the ministry of reconciliation. Lord, for the souls of men. Lord, for the reality of hell. Lord, help us during this Christmas season as lights, as ambassadors. Lord, to be burdened for souls. Lord, whether it's just simply grabbing some of the tracks and making use of them, of singling out a family member that maybe we won't see outside of, of this Christmas season. But Lord, help us to be sensitive. Lord, help us to be mindful of the souls of men. And Father, we do pray for our, for our missionaries, for our church family. Lord, help us to be, to be good lights. Lord, we ask you to bless our service tonight. Lord, we do love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.